Hey dude, I bet you clicked on this video because you were raised in a Christian home and you were homeschooled. Just like me. If that is the case and you are like me, there's only basically three paths you could have taken after you left the Christian home. You could have stayed on the noble path and had a bunch of beautiful kids, you know, had a God-fearing, virtuous family. Beautiful, and that's beautiful. You should email me a picture of your kids and just know just just the whole family together and I'll put them up on that board right there and I'll applaud you for your great work sir second option in your 20s you fell off the path because you're a loser and you're just like I don't know man I don't know what's going on we can't know the truth we're just on a space rock let's float it out and let's see what happens you're an agnostic which I honestly respect a little bit you know you're just floating it out like you're just here to party but you're just too cowardly to, you know, examine the evidence. Obviously, none of the polytheistic religions are correct. It's just philosophically impossible. The monotheistic God can be proven through reason and logic. I can get to that in another video. And so that leaves you with three options. Muslims, Jews, or Christians. And if you want to be a Muslim, you probably shouldn't because Muhammad had sex with a six-year-old. Muhammad poop be upon him. <laughs> so basically, that leaves you with two options, Jews and Christians. Go on from there, buddy. It leaves us with path number three. This is where it gets really dark and gloomy. If you're on path number three, that means you completely rebelled against your sweet little Christian parents. And uh, you became an atheistic, you know, neo-Marxist, Darwinian loser. But... No matter what path you took, I can guarantee you watched VeggieTales and you liked it. The name VeggieTales is such a creative name, it really gets me going, okay? Because if you think about it, VeggieTales, <laughs> vegetables are healthy for your body, right? But the tales told in this show are healthy for your soul. The Englishman who went up the hill and came down with all the bananas. who went up a hill and came down with all the bananas. This show is so great compared to the absolute brain rot kids are watching on TikTok and YouTube nowadays that's probably making their soul look like Gollum. And they probably don't even eat their vegetable too, so they're probably going to grow up to not be big and strong. But even though I am Christian and I was homeschooled, I'm an outlier. I'm not a huge VeggieTales guy. And maybe that's because along with only like one other Mexican family, we were the only Catholics in a group of Protestants in our homeschool co-op. If you don't know what a co-op is, it's basically where homeschoolers get lonely and they get together with other homeschoolers. During that time, it was like being a, a Catholic during the Protestant Revolution in France. And I, yeah, that's right. I said revolution, not reformation. I mean, one time it was crazy. I was taking a poop at this Protestant homeschooler's house, you know? And I heard like a push, push, push outside the door. I opened the door and there was a 95 Theses on the outside saying, you need to stop indulging in SpongeBob SquarePants right now and start watching VeggieTales or we're leaving and starting our own co-op. And I'll have you know, I didn't falter one bit. I didn't give into the heresy of VeggieTales alone. Now, while a Protestant and Catholic war actually didn't break out at these co-ops, the VeggieTales alone part is true. I mean, that is all these kids watch. The family that hosted the co-op was basically only allowed to watch VeggieTales. I don't even think they had like cable. They only had like five channels and they were all news. And like three of them were like in Spanish. And so basically on the side of their TV, they had like a stack of VeggieTale VHS tapes and they just pop them in. Every, every, you know, get done with school, pop a VHS in. Let's see what Larry's doing right now. Absolutely no hate to these guys. I love these guys. But I'm glad my mom was more nuanced when it came to the art she exposed us to, like to the entertainment she exposed us to. Us Catholics, as you may know from a lot of our cathedrals in Europe, we love beauty. Beauty is one of the three transcendentals. It brings people in. So uh, us Catholics in the car, instead of VeggieTales, we would listen to The Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter. 
classics. I mean, there's even some drama to go down regarding Harry Potter and the co-op. You know, some of the ladies fell for the satanic panic that was going around when Harry Potter was popular, even though the, the story was written by a Christian and uh, the main character dies and rises from the dead to defeat the Dark Lord. Hmm. It sounds pretty familiar to some other story I can't put my finger on. But we did eventually get them to hop on the Harry Potter train and they ran through all the books, but they didn't do the same for us with the VeggieTales phenomenon. The only thing I remember about VeggieTales is the Where Is My Hairbrush song by Larry the Cucumber. That these guys, these they just sing it over and over. Just on repeat. And I can understand why they did it. It's pure poetry. That's where this show hit its peak. Having heard his wandering, Bob the Tomato enters the scene. Shocked and slightly embarrassed at the sight of Larry in a towel, Bob regains his composure and confesses. Larry, that old hairbrush of yours. Well, you never use it. You don't really need it. So, well, I'm sorry. I didn't know. But I gave it to the peach. Because he's got hair. Feeling a deep sense of loss, Larry stumbles back and laments. Not bad. Oh, my hairbrush. Not fair. My poor hairbrush. Not fair, not fair, no hair, not fair, no wear, no hair, not fair, not fair, not fair. My little hairbrush. If you think about it, the Where Is My Hairbrush song by Larry the Cucumber is actually a three act structured Shakespearean alchemical drama where Larry goes through the three stages of detachment and spiritual perfection as he comes to realize that he really has no use for his beloved hairbrush because he doesn't have any hair. It could also be seen as an allegory for the loss of a friendship or romantic relationship because you're now incompatible with each other. They don't find you, you know, useful anymore, so they kick you to the curb. They go to somebody else. You still love them because of all the memories and time you've spent together and you, your heart longs for the presence, it longs for them just to be there and run their hands through your hair, fix your hair, like that cute way girls fix their your hair, but you're just not good, you're just not good enough anymore. Your hair's not good enough. Why would a hairbrush hang around with a guy with no hair? It just, it doesn't work. Of course the hairbrush is gonna choose the guy with the most luscious locks, despite you all you've been through. Also, notice the deliberate non-nakedness of the cucumber Larry. Vegetables are usually naked, like how Adam and Eve were naked in the Garden of Eden before the fall. It's Larry's egotistical attachment to something he can't have, in this case, a hairbrush, that can be seen as an echo of Eve wanting to have the knowledge of good and evil, which is the one thing she couldn't have as well. In both of these situations, while they're usually comfortable being naked, they now both cover themselves up and are embarrassed because of their iniquities, and they're unable to be seen by God or other vegetables due to their attachment to sin. This tune expressed the dilemma of the human condition. We long and look our whole lives for material objects that we think will fill the empty void in our heart, when in reality, there's nothing there. None of these material things will be able to satisfy our heart's otherworldly desires. All this incessant chase after wind to fill the hole in our hearts is like trying to comb your hair you don't even have. In the end, it's all vanity. When it comes to Christian art, I do prefer what Catholics have produced, like Dante's Inferno, the Pieta, the Sistine Chapel, you know, the Passion of the Christ more recently by Mel Gibb. But when it comes to what Protestants have made, art-wise, I think VeggieTales is the greatest thing a Protestant has made since Paradise Lost by John Milton. But let's actually revisit the show together because I only remember Silly Songs with Larry, and uh, I actually heard that the first episode is like a fever dream. It's called... Where is God when I'm scared? So this episode starts off with an ominous black and white reverse zoom shot where there are two characters at a frame. One sounds like an Italian and the other sounds like a character from the Muppets, but I can't, you know, put my finger on which one. I don't believe you can do it. Well then stand back and behold as I throw this switch. VeggieTales does this a lot. They make a parody of some other well-known property and this time it's Frankenstein. But instead of Frankenstein, it's Frankenstellary. Instead of it being about what happens when you separate man from being made in the image of God, it's about what happens when you separate celery from la ranch. Spoiler alert, it's horrific. <laughs> the Frank and celery creature escapes to, um, I guess, to go murder the Italian scientist's wife out of hatred for the fact that he was created 
and he didn't want to be created. And the camera slowly pans over to Junior's face, and it's horrified. <laughs> Junior! Despite being traumatized, when his mother tells him that it's time to go to bed, a part of Jimmy wants to keep watching. A gross part of him. Maybe it's the stem. But Junior's mother convinces him to jump his little bum upstairs and tells him that it's definitely too scary. He can't be watching this stuff. But then my boy just goes gets bamboozled and he just starts hallucinating. <laughs> Cut to Junior, all cozy in bed, starts to have a panic attack, and his entire room starts to shake around him, and then like a tomato and a cucumber fall out of his ceiling. Bob the tomato says he's here to help, but I don't, I don't believe that for one second, because tomatoes, in my experience, are known to be slimy, they're known to be sleazy. I'd never trust a tomato. Larry the Cucumber starts citing Luke 210, which might mean that Larry and Bob are actually angels in the vegetable world, because that verse is Angel Gabriel talking to Mary or somebody, talking to those boys. Or I think it might be a jab at the Muhammadans, the Muslims, because they're saying that a baby asparagus is smarter than Muhammad, who got fooled by an Angel Gabriel who was a demon. I know you're not the Angel Gabriel. The real Angel Gabriel never confuses me. He just tells me that it's okay to have sex with little girls and that it's okay to rape our female captives and that it's okay to take the wife of my own formerly adopted son and that it's okay to hire prostitutes. He basically tells me anything I want to hear. Sounds like Satan. But Bob and Larry definitely aren't angels because they start gaslighting the hell out of Junior. But I'm five years old, so I can handle it. Oh, so you weren't scared. Nope. I wasn't scared. He wasn't scared. No, not scared a bit. Well, maybe just a little bit. Oh, d just a little bit scared? Oh, a little bit. But not too scared. Oh, well, yeah. Uh-huh. But Bob and Larry sing him a song, which frightens him even more, and things, you could say, get confrontational. There's a hundred tiny monsters jumping right into your jammies. What are you going to do? I'm going to call the police. No. But luckily they turned around really quick and they let him know that God is bigger than all your fears. Which is actually genuinely a nice lesson because God as you know, isn't bound by space or time. He's infinite. And fear is mostly caused by the fear of dying or going through a lot of pain. And by abiding in God through love, you're able to transcend the finite and material, and thus you don't need to fear anything physical or be anxious about anything, like even dying. What's love? That's what's, what God is, right? So when you love, and that can be the simplest thing, you are participating in God. In fact, you have found the place that transcends uh, the categories of finitude. But due to Bob and Larry's faulty theology that assumes that God is physical, Junior asked Bob if God is bigger than the slime monster and if he's able to squirt slime out of his ears. You see, you don't have to be afraid because God is the biggest. What? Is he bigger than King Kong? Because Kong's a really big monkey and he's kind of scary. Well, is he bigger than the slime monster? Because he's the biggest monster of them all. Compared to God, the slime monster is like a teeny little cornflake. Yeah, but the slime monster can squirt slime out of his ears. Can God squirt slime out of his ears? Now that I think about it, I don't think St. Thomas Aquinas or any other theologian addressed the slime in the ears God dilemma. I, my faith is absolutely shaken. Here's some more odd theology from Larry here. He tells Junior that God farted, and then there were stars. What do you see up there? My curtains. No, out the window, up in the sky. I see lots of stars. God made all the stars out of nothing. He just went, and there they were. We don't have any solid evidence that Jesus was a farter. But it didn't matter because the universe was created before Jesus became incarnate. So yeah, 
actually the stars weren't farted into exist existence, but stars made are made of gas. So that actually does make sense if God farted and, and light is made out of gas. But no, no, God is more of a speaker. God said, let there be light and there is light. But I guess the fart parable gets the point across because Junior starts to become more convinced, admitting that a slime monster couldn't do that. And if the slime monster trying to make those stars, things would get sticky, which is a great observation. I think St. Thomas Aquinas should use that in his rebuttal in his Summa. This is a comforting message for Junior and all the little kids watching. But the thing is, that isn't God's plan for Junior. God made Junior, you know, asparaguses. He made little asparaguses so they'll grow up to be chopped off, grilled, and like chomped up, you know? But Bob shouldn't tell him that. I mean, that's probably what the Calvinists would do. If a Calvinist wrote the episodes for VeggieTales, Larry and Bob at the end would just be like, remember kids, God loves you very much and he made you for a special purpose. If you're one of his elect, and if you're not one of his elect, well, he made you for the very special purpose of burning in hell for eternity. Like, he predestined you to burn. All right, kids, we'll see you next time. But anyway, despite the false comfortings of Bob and Larry, when Frank and Sally pops in, Junior gets bamboozled again. But Frank and Sally lets uh, Junior know that he isn't a monster, and his real name is uh, Phil Winkenstein. And he's an actor from Toledo. He tries to convince Junior that he's a regular guy and he wouldn't hurt anyone. But it's still a little suspicious that this actor from Toledo, you know, has showed up at this little kid's house. And he still has his makeup on from presumably a movie that he did years ago. Like, but finally, Junior, filled with courage and zeal and love for God, hops up on his bed to sing a solo with all his heart. And it's a good one. So when I'm lying in my bed the furniture starts creeping. I'll just laugh and say, hey, cut that out and get back to my sleeping. Cause I know that God's the biggest and he's watching all the while. So when I get scared, I'll think of him and close my eyes and smile. I mean, towards the end there, they sing a, a song you know, God is bigger than the boogeyman. And they go so hard on it that they looks like they're having a seizure. But as soon as that fever dream of a performance hits its last note, there's a knock on the door from Junior's dad. And Bob and Larry and Phil Winkenstein, the actor from Toledo, just disappear. Junior's father comes in and sits on Junior's bed. And that's our cue to know that the moral of this episode, even though it was, you know, explicitly expressed multiple times. It's going to be expressed again just to make sure these stupid kids got into their stupid brains. Junior's dad tells him that the show is too scary for him. But Junior makes the great rebuttal that even though God doesn't squirt slime out of his ears, he's bigger than any fear that a horror movie could put on his heart. And he has no need to worry because the same God that has the power to create the whole universe is taking care of him too. And after all that pontificating and abstract thinking on the metaphysical nature of God, you know, and whether he has slime, the slime come out of his ears, his earthly father, who is there for him, just like his spiritual father, tells him to shut down his little thinker and get to bed. And all little juniors, little, uh, he's little, he can, uh, he can fall asleep peacefully. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What will we eat? What will we drink? Or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Phil Vishner, I know you're watching. Thanks for making the show. You're a great guy. And uh, maybe you didn't achieve the grandiose status that Walt Disney achieved because he 
went the secular route. But you definitely stored up treasures in heaven for all the children that you accepted into your care in the name of Jesus Christ. So keep on evangelizing, brother, and you guys do the same. Keep making those little families. Have a bunch of kids, dude. Start pumping out those kids right now. And if you don't, I'm gonna come to your house and uh, I'm gonna oversee you and how many kids you're pumping. I'll see you next time.